Okay, so tonight we're going to do the last of a series of lessons that I've been doing all year long, going down in the family search um, program search menu, hitting all the different features in the search menu, records, images, uh, the catalog tonight, uh, books, genealogies, the wiki. We've gone through all the the features in the search menu. And so we're tonight we're going to go through the card catalog and talk a little bit about it because a lot of people I think are scared of it and don't go there and therefore miss out on a lot of good stuff. And so we're going to briefly try to go through the card catalog a little bit tonight. You're also going to see this picture on the screen is not mine. I stole it from Family Search, but there'll be quite a few pictures inside the presentation that I took in the newly remodeled Family History Library in Salt Lake back in July. It is really a beautiful building. So with that, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the library in Salt Lake and the fact that it's not just your everyday library. It's a little bit different because it has all the holdings in the familysearch.org program, the catalog does. The catalog also has everything that's in the family history library. No, I'll take that back. Church, uh, the, yeah, the family history library. And then holdings from other libraries that Family Search partners with certain holdings from those libraries also. So it's a card catalog of libraries and collections, not just what's physically in that building. Okay, well, even when you go in the catalog, you're able to see things that are in the form of microfilm, microfiche, or physical books, magazines, and things like that. And then also all the digital images that Family Search has. And like I say, it's not your ordinary library because some of the holdings are all over the United States and you're able to get to some of them through the catalog and the internet. Okay, this might be a view of the library you're used to seeing. So what exactly is found in the catalog? Okay, there's microfilm found in there. Now they announced just a couple of weeks ago that all the microfilm's been filmed. So what we'll say then is that a lot of the microfilm that used to be in those drawers is now in digital format, but there's still some of it that isn't because we have things that are digital, but they need to be manually searched because they don't have any indexes or they're digital and they're indexed, which we love and we can search them or they're digital, but restricted. So therefore, you might still need to go, if you can't find it at your family history center, go to the library and actually pull the film and read it. And then there's others that are digital, but they're only available in the microfilm format. You're still gonna find things in the catalog that have the old roll of microfilm next to them. Because even though they're digital, if let's say they're under copyright, they can't produce that digital image online because it's copyrighted. So the real bottom line is do not throw your readers away. If you've got any films that have restrictions in such a way that they do not show up even at a family history center in digital format, because if you throw away the readers, you'll never be able to read those films if you still have those films. Okay, the microfiche have never been digitized. And so they're gonna show up with that round symbol, the real symbol, even though they're not on reels. And eventually they're gonna micro, they're gonna digitize some of them, but most of them are things that were in microfilm format also. So I don't think they'll do a lot of them. And then the books and print materials, well, many of them have been digitized, but some are still under copyright. 
or the copyright holder hasn't given permission for viewing. So there are still books in Salt Lake that we can't view, not even at a center. And the non-digitized books have to be viewed in Salt Lake. And so they've developed that uh, system where you can go in and, and request a lookup in the books and you can do that with the Salt Lake books. Now, there'll be other books in the catalog that aren't in Salt Lake. They might be in the Mid-Continent Library in Independence, Missouri. They might be in the Allen County Library back in Indiana or somewhere else. Those will always be digital, but even some of them will have restrictions placed on them. And then the surprising thing is in the card catalog, books and things like that, that show up and they're actually held in different family history centers. I ran into one just last week that was at the Pocatello, Idaho Family History Center. And it was listed in the card catalog as the one place that held that book. So I know where to go looking if I'm ever up in Pocatello. So those are the kinds of things that are in the catalog. And you can see that there's many different variations of what's available, what isn't available. So how they organize the catalog? Well, they have things so that we can search by the place where the records are found or the people are found by surnames, by author, subject, keywords, or a thing called call number, image group, or fiche number. Those are the kind of searches we can do. And what we'll do is we'll focus on one of them, the place search, and go through it in its entirety, and then just briefly talk about the others. Okay, so why, why do they have place searches? Well, remember, in the catalog, you don't search for people. You don't go looking for a person normally. Occasionally you might find something if there's a book about a person, then yes, you could possibly search for a person. But in general, you're searching for record groups and pay books and things that might mention your person. So it's not a place to go looking for people. It's a place to go look for records and things like that or books. And so normally we focus on finding records about people, documents that pertain to people. And those documents usually have to be linked to some location where the person lived. And if we had know where the person lived, then we can go look for records that will help us with that person. And the kinds of records that we can look for, and we'll talk about in just a minute. The way we organize the search though, to find these records, is by describing the location and family search uses a four level descriptor they have they talk about the city the county the state and the country those are the four levels of size of locations and every location in the world is organized that way and based on their country, like if you're in England, you're talking about shires instead of counties. In Canada, you're talking about provinces instead of counties and things like that. We normally think of it city, county, state, country. The catalog will transpose those and it will show up on the screen as country, city, county, or country, state, county city. So like if we want to talk about Yuba City, in our mind, we usually think of Yuba City, Sutter County, California, United States, the catalog will say United States, California, Sutter, Yuba City. That's just the way it's organized. So you have to kind of get used to that. So when you're looking to do a match with what you're typing in, be aware that it's going to show up in reverse order. And it has to be that way. Okay, so if we want to go searching for a place, like let's say Fresno, I don't have to type the whole name. I started typing Fresno 
and up comes 44 results in the catalog. 44 things, places that have Fresno. There's one in Madrid, Spain. Fresno, Madrid, Spain. There's one in Guadalajara, Fresno, Guadalajara, Spain. And there's one in Ohio. I've known, I had a cousin in Fresno, Ohio, in Coshocton County or Coshocton County in Ohio. And then of course there's our Fresno. Now, as you start typing Fresno, that list comes up. If you want Fresno County, you highlight the one that's in green and press on it and it fills it in for you. If I wanted the city of Fresno, I'd go to, to down from there where it says Fresno, Fresno, California, United States, and click on that. But it is interesting how many places have the name Fresno in it in the catalog. Now, if you spell something wrong, you're going to get no results. And so beware of that. If you get no results, there's two possible reasons. One is you've done a spelling error. And the second one is that there is nothing for a place with that name in the catalog because they're not going to give you results for places that they don't have anything for. And so you've got to be real careful. Don't just assume when you type the name in and nothing comes up that there's nothing for it. Beware, you might have spelled it differently than the catalog has it. And names have changed na spellings in some locations around the world over time. And so you may need to do a little bit of research to see if there was another way to spell the place. And especially you think of Poland and the areas that are shared with Germany over the wars where they've had German variations of the name and then Polish variations of the names. You have all kinds of issues like that. So just be aware. But if you spell wrong, you're probably going to have trouble getting good answers. OK, search tips and ideas about the place searching. The first thing is, at the country level, you're going to find a real multitude of records. You go to the United States, there's going to be thousands and thousands of collections. And you may not really want to have to search all those, but you may have to if you can't find anything at one of the lower levels. But you just be aware, you'll probably have to weed through a lot. What will happen is you will probably find some state records and maybe even some city records that are buried in the country records for, let's say, the United States. And so you, if you can't find them at the level you think you should find them at, do try on a higher level. It's possible that they'll show up. If you're searching at the state level, there'll be a lot of records. And it will include some city and county records, too, that didn't get separated out and placed under the city or county designations, but you'll actually find them listed in the state records when you go there. So if you're looking for, say, a um, maybe it's a deed or something like that that somehow got held at the state level. Like I know early uh, New Hampshire deeds aren't found at the county level. They're found in the state papers of New Hampshire. They're actually the, 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 the uh, colonial records of New Hampshire. And so sometimes you have to go to a different level of uh, ownership to find things. When you do get down to the city or county level, county records, will, there'll be some. You're going to find as we go down this list, the records become less and less. City records, there, there won't be very many. There'll be a lot of cities that there aren't any city specific records. You'll find them all under the county level. And so don't be surprised. So the big thing on this is when you're searching for a place, if you know, you can try to start very specific, but don't be surprised if you don't need to narrow it or spread it out instead of narrowing it. If you start out with uh, Yuba City, Sutter County, you might find, well, I can't find anything under Yuba City, so I will try Sutter County. If I can't find what I need under Sutter County, 
I'll go to the state of California and search there. You may have to find that as a pattern that you use just because A, the way things are organized and B, the fact that we have very few specific to city and even county records in many cases. Okay, so we need to think records and when we think records, and this is not the family history library by any means. This is a stock image of a, a library or an archive somewhere. I've seen some that are just about that bad. And uh, when we're thinking of records, you know, you have to begin to think as a, as a genealogist and that could be you know, difficult for some of us if we're not genealogists be, to begin with, but we need to start thinking about the kinds of records there are death records, birth, marriage, divorce, guardianship, wills, administrations, court records, deeds, mortgages, histories, you know, Bibles, naturalization records, military records, all those different kinds of records. We kind of have to get a feel for these things. There is a real easy way to educate yourself if you feel weak about this. But you know, you're gonna, sooner or later, you're gonna have to probably do this because you're gonna have a patron that needs some research help. And so the thing to do is, Go to the research wiki on family search go to familysearch.org search and wiki pull up the locality and then read about if you're needing a death record in that locality go pull it up and see what it tells you about death records now you're ready to see if you can find something in the card catalog that will help the person because you'll know what kind of records to go look for and what's available, let's say, in that state. Okay, record availability. Before I get to that, this is a picture now of a workstation in the Family History Library. This is down in the international floor where they do a lot of film reading. Those are three monitors for one patron. You can put the, the film you're reading here. You could put your genealogy program over here, like if you have Roots Magic or something like that. And over here, you could put a uh, maybe a um, handwriting helper that helps you translate the writing of the people. So they really have a nice setup now for patrons that come into the library. But record availability, these are those symbols we're gonna find in the catalog. You're gonna find the camera with the magnifying glass. That's what you wanna find, you hope. Only 20% of all records are in this category. Only 20% of our records have been digitized and indexed. That means 80% don't fall in this category. You understand that when you're using family search to find names and you only search by index names, you're eliminating 80% of the holdings of the church because 80% are not indexed. Now, you'll find others that have just the camera. Those are the unindexed films and but if they have the camera they're online and if there's no other symbol you're able to view it now the other option with the camera is the little key and that key locks the image it means that that image is not viewable for you at home you're going to have to go to the family history library or a family history center or affiliate library. Now, one thing you've got to be careful of, and I've seen this happen to me before, I've looked at a certain roll of film, I can look at the images, I go eat lunch, I come back, and now the images say I'm not able to view them. What happened was I was signed in to family search before, and it signed me out while I went to lunch. And when I come back, I'm no longer signed into family search and it throws the lock up. 
because that particular role of film requires you to be signed into family search. Not all films will do this to you, but a lot do. So be sure when you're viewing these things that you view them after you've signed into family search and you're currently in there signed in. Otherwise you may get this when you don't need to get this. But these are the famous locked records. And then the last one is, even though everything's digitized, some of them are just gonna show the real because A, they haven't been able to get those images, those digital images up online yet because they're backed up. That's one possibility. Or two, they aren't going to put them up because they're restricted by copyright and we can't publish them in digital form. So these are the four options you're gonna see when you go to look up something in the card catalog. Okay, so let's do a search. We're gonna search for a will for a John Sands who died about 1881 in Pennsylvania. He's one of my great, great uncles. And I believe he lived and died in Columbia County, Pennsylvania. Now that's important because generally wills are filed in the county that the person lived in. Doesn't have to be, but in most cases, that's what happens. There are exceptions, but we'll try Columbia County. So I went searching, I typed Columbia, and one of the choices is Columbia, Pennsylvania, United States. So that's the one I want. So I click on it, and then I click on search. And this comes up with a page with all the records that we have on the county of Columbia County, Pennsylvania. It tells me at the top it was created in 1813. So this is 1881 that I'm looking for. So it was a county in those days. And I'm gonna go down here where it says probate records because wills and administrations are found under probate records. Administrations are when a person dies intestate without a will, then their estate is administered. Otherwise it is probated based on the will. The little four there after probate means there's four collections. So I'm gonna click on that line and that expands these four collections. Now I need a will from 1881. And it shows me that uh, there's mortgages, wills, administrations, and miscellaneous records up to 1833. That's not going to help me. The second one goes up to 1865. That's not going to help me. <coughs> Orphan's Court, which often held wills, only goes up to 1869. Whoops, that doesn't help me. But this last one, wills and administrations, 1813 to 1912, and indexes up to 1974, that appears to be what I want. Now, you may wonder, why did they stop in 1812? There was probably a privacy rule when they published these. It was probably done 20, 30, 40 years ago when they filmed them. There may have been a requirement in Pennsylvania that you could only film up to the year 1912. And so that's why they stopped in 1912. They didn't stop wills in that, at that date, but we stopped filming at that level. So I, anyway, I need to go to this. So when I go to there, it tells me about this, that this was information that was found in the County Court of Columbia County. That's the repository found at the Registrar of Wills office. And there's nine microfilm reels, nine reels of film. And then it says, Pennsylvania probate records are available online, click here. I'm not gonna go there because that's gonna take me to all the probate records for all the state of Pennsylvania. And then I'm gonna have to go find Columbia again. I'm already in Columbia County on this page. I'm just gonna scroll past there and look at what they have at the bottom of the page. They'll have a listing of those nine microfilm reels. You'll notice they all have cameras. They don't have the lock, so that means I can see them. They don't have the little magnifying glass 
So that means I'm going to have to scroll through them. Okay. Now there's two levels of index. The first film's A to K, and the second one is L to Z. My guy's last name is Sands. He falls under L to Z. So I need to click on the little camera at the end of that row. And this comes up, and this is where the faint of heart scream and close the page and go somewhere else because they panic. Don't panic. This isn't as scary as it might look if you've never done this before. Think of a book and somebody has laid the book out for you page by page in sequence here. And the wind can't blow the pages around because they're stuck there permanently. And you'll be able to see the whole book this way without physically having to turn pages because each one of those little thumbnail images is a page from this book. And this book has 1,081 pages. And this is just an index. Okay, so how do you deal with all this? Well, notice how the first line there, the first uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or I'll say the first six pages look a little different. Those are like the chapter heading. In this particular chapter heading, remember this was the alphabetical index from L to Z. This portion is a book that has L through R. I need S, S comes right after R. So I need the next chapter, the next group within this thousand page collection. So on that page that had all this stuff, I just scroll down until I see another group of funny looking pages where at least one of them's all black. And that'll be the heading for the next chapter or group. And down around image 610, I found another one. And this is the index for S through Z. So now I'm in business. Why am I going to the index instead of straight to the wills? Well, I wanna find out if John's actually got a will. I don't want to go to the, in, the wills and start looking through them if John doesn't have one. So I need to know if John's even got a will. And this will tell me. So the first page in there tells us a little bit about the system. This is a strange thing called the COT indexing system. COT was a company that printed up these books that were used in virtually every courthouse in America at the turn of the 1900s, the beginning of the 1900s and even earlier. And it's a system where when they do the alphabet and let's say they're in the letter S, they'll take all the surnames that start in SA and put them on a page and they'll be put in sequentially as the wills and administrations are entered so that they're in a numerical listing, not a totally, totally alphabetical, but all surnames starting with SA will be lumped together. Then if there would be something SB, they'd be lumped together. The SCs are lumped together. The SEs are lumped together and so on. There is a catch to this though. If your surname's a real popular surname, they don't put it like in the essay section, they give it a page of its own. And that page of its own could be anywhere in this book. And so we need to look at the index to see if, those, if our name we need happens to be on one of those strange pages and what page is it so we can find the darn thing. Okay, so. We're going to start hitting the little uh, forward arrow up at the top and move to the next page and move through till we find the page that shows SA. And okay, it turned up out to be a couple of pages over. And in the column for SA and SB, which would begin on page one of the indexes of the index. I notice that SANS has its own page. So that means if I go to page one of this index, I'm not gonna find any SANS. There'll be a bunch of people with SA 
first names, there will be no sans. I have to go to page 95 to find the sans. So that's why in these caught indexes, they're a little tricky. You have to look at this first page so you know what you're up against. And this goes through each letter of the alphabet. You can see like SCs, there's a whole slew of them. Where in the SAs, there's only uh, five different surnames that have their own page. So anyway, the bottom line is I need to go to page 95. So what I do is I scroll through till I actually get to page one of the real indexes, not those things that are explaining where to look, but I went past them to get to the actual page one in this book. That's on this image 618. So now I need 95, but I won't do any good to add 95 to the 618 to get to page 95 or add 94 to that, because some of the pages have an A or a B, like a 1A and then the next one's 1B. So there's really even more. So I tried adding 100 to 618, that brought me up to 718, and that only got me to page 60. So I added 60 more pages and went to 778, and that took me a little too far to page 107. So I just used the little back arrow thing and just back arrowed until I could get to uh, page 95, which was on image 766. And I've somehow enlarged that by accident. Okay, so here's page 95. And sure enough, it's all sans. Do is ditto, okay? And then they list the names of people based on parts of the alphabet. So Angeline's in the first column where the A's are, Joseph's in the second column where the J's are. These are not alphabetical by uh, first names. They're in sequence by the order they were recorded. And so the first one was in 1881, Joseph E. Sands, and his is the letters of administration that was granted. He didn't have a will, it's blank. My guy is on line two. John Sands, and sure enough, he has a will. It's on page 57 of book five. So I need to find will book five and go to page 57. At least I don't have to run through the book hoping to find something. I'll know I'll find it if I can find book five and go to page 57. So if I want to, I can actually create a source for this by clicking on attach to family tree. This is something that would be a good source for John. Even though it's not the actual will, it's just the index. So I clicked on create a source and I filled in this little box where it says title with John Sands died 1881, will and probate index, Columbia County, Pennsylvania probate records, 1683 to 1994. Okay, and I should put in some notes, but I didn't. So then I click select person and I go pull up his ID out of tree and paste it in there. KZJ3TKQ, then pick that, hit that little arrow, and that'll bring him up. I make sure that he gets checked, and then I can check other people. This is his wife. She's not, she's named, no, she's not named in the will because she had passed away. He's a widower. And then below there, though, is his daughter, Fanny, and then below her is Mary. So I can click on them also, and it will attach the source to the three of them, John and his two daughters. So I do that, and then I give it a reason. I say, well, this is John Sands, who's the son of Joseph E. Sands and Esther Lundy. He was a widower with two living children named Fanny and Mary, who are named in the will. And then I click attach and it's attached to 
his record. Now I got to go find that will. So I go back to those nine films and I look down through the list and after the indexes are the will books, volume one and two, three, four, and here's five. So I just click on five and I don't need to be worried about all this so much. The index was, for this was at the beginning, but I already know where I need to go. So I go find the first page of the will book. This is actually page one. Each page or each image here actually covers two pages, a left page and a right page. So I don't need to go to uh, 57 pages. I need to go to about 27 or 20, 28 pages. I need to go 28 pages. So or I added, for whatever reason, uh, anyway, I added a bunch of pages to it and I ended up on um, a little bit off and I had to move around a couple of pages, but I got there within just a few seconds. And here's the actual will. Well, it isn't the actual will. In these will books, the people would bring the will in. This is before they had copy machines and the recorder would write the will down in the record book. So this is a copy of the original will. So the recorder writes it down, hopefully in better handwriting than the original. And this is really in pretty good shape. And then they give back the original copy to the family, but it is now a court document. And so that's pretty cool. This is a fun will because his daughters were young and they were underage. He even says in the will, they can pick whatever guardian they want for themselves. They get to live in the house until they marry. And um, he says in here that this property though, if he should die before fall, that it was to be sold on a certain date when the crops were ready to come in, where it would be at its highest value. If it didn't sell for a decent price, then they were to maintain it. And he was providing funds to keep it maintained until the following spring after planting. And then it was to be put up for auction again in hopes that it would be at a high value at that point. He had livestock, he had cattle apparently, and the cattle were to be sold at a certain date. And I mean, it's really kind of a strange will. And then it says if his daughters don't have issue, if they don't marry and have children, that the, the property that remains, the house, in other words, and whatever else the girls had, were to be divided between two of his brothers that he names and two of his wife's brothers, his brother-in-laws, who he names in this will. And so it's really kind of an interesting will. So anyway, so that's what you get. And it's also given a chance to be uh, sourced. I could source it too. Okay, so that's how you go find something using the catalog. The surname search on the catalog is great because, you know, genealogists believe in not reinventing the wheel. So sometimes it's nice to see if somebody's written a book on our family so that we can see what they, these people thought about it. Okay, family search has a little over 356,000 books. And so there's a good chance that one of them just might have your family surname. These are also books on locations and stuff like that. They are not all family. Well, they are family histories. I'll take that back. There was 356,000 family histories. Okay. Now, using this catalog is one of two ways to see these. We could also go to the books link in the search menu on family search. I think this one's a little easier to use myself. So I like to come over in the car catalog. There are some drawbacks. Not all the books can be seen online. Some of them are strictly hardback books. Some are on microfilm that's not available. 
and some of them are digitized but restricted. Think of copyrighted books. But at least you have a chance to know there's a book and maybe you can find it in another catalog or another library. And the Family History Library does a lookup service so that you can say, go to such and such a book and see if you can find this person and give them information about the person. And um, I think I've covered a, both of those things already. Yeah, they're not digitized. Try libraries near you. Use uh, uh, CardCat if you want to see other libraries that might have it. Okay, so let's go search for somebody. I have a new line that I've just been working on that I just tied into my family and I need to verify it. And I've got this guy, Shubal Throwbridge. Now there's a name for you. I want to see if I can find where this information came from because I want to verify things like this because I didn't research this. I don't know how accurate this might be. Okay, so I'm going to go to surnames. Notice I changed from searching by place to surnames. So under surnames, I put throw bridge in there and say search. And I get 96 results or something like that. I can't see the number up there. This first one, this ancestors of Francis Bacon throw bridge. It turns out that this book was digitized, but not indexed and it's locked. So I can't see it anyway. So that's a bummer. The second one is a book that's in book form. It's a hardback book. It's on a roll of microfilm, but the roll of film shows the little film image. So it's not available online, probably because this was written in 1996 and under copyright. So I might have to ask for a lookup and see if my guy is mentioned in there. The next book has the same problem as book two. So again, I might need to send in a, a request to look. This last one sounded pretty good. It was written by a guy born back in 1930. It is available, it's digital and available for me to look at. So I click on it. It says there's a digital version of it. Click here, so we're in business. So I pull the book up and it says there's 144 pages. So I click view all 144 pages. That's how I get in and open the book. At this point, I can do a search in there and I search for my guy's first name and nothing comes up. So this was a bummer. It was only 144, 141 page book. So it's possible this covered some other descendancy. Another line of descent probably from the original people that came to America and didn't include my guy. So I was out of luck. So one last try, I went back to the list of books and I found this book that's 973 pages long. This is, this is the Bible on this family. It was written a long time ago, over a hundred years ago. So it's probably out of date, but I wanna know if this is where the information came from. So I say, click on all 100, 973 pages. And sure enough, I do a search on him and here he is. And it has his information about when he was born and where when and who he married. It mentions that he was a private in the New Jersey militia in the revolution. And there's a little footnote there and it gives some information. It says his regiment's not given in the officers and men of New Jersey in the revolution, which is interesting. Now I go through the son, John, and it gives his birth date and then says may have immigrated to Ohio and then has the little note. I love this because the guy explains family tradition said that those two sons, Justice and John, probably moved west to Ohio. And it talks about Justice and how 
there's some information about him. And then this guy sent letters to the descendants of both of these guys and nobody ever responded. And so this is very common. People in those days when they disappear, the family assumes when they move away, they move west and Ohio was the place in the 1800s that Pennsylvania and New Jersey people moved to. So they assumed it was Ohio. In fact, my John went west. He went west from uh, New Jersey to Maryland. Well, actually, that means he went southwest a little bit. And then from there, he moved to Virginia. So he went even further south. So his west was really south. And the justice appears to have gone up into Pennsylvania to Columbia County, where other parts of my family are. But anyway, I found the guy. I now know where the records came from. So that's nice. And as you can see, I can download the book or I can copy off the page like this and make an image of it. Okay, other types of searches and we'll be done. Here's the author search, a subject search, a keyword search, and a call number search. Those first three, author, subject, and keyword are pretty much self-explanatory. We can skip those. Now, last one needs a little bit of explaining. They've been doing some changes on some things. One is sometimes you might be given a call number for a book and then you can't find the book. It might say the name of the book is such and such and here's its call number and you can't get the book by name to come up. Well, you can put the call number in and search by it if you happen to know it. The other one now is what they call image group or the DGS, digital genealogical something or other. Now, what they've done is now that all the films are digitized, the films all now have DGS numbers instead of film numbers. So the films still have those film numbers on them, but you can only search for the DGS number, which is listed in the catalog right at the right hand side of the listing for each film. I should have pointed that out. Fiche still have their Fiche number, but the films all use the DGS. But if you wanted to go find the film in the library in Salt Lake, you would need to use the film number to go into the shelves and locate it. But if you try to search for that in the catalog, those film numbers no longer work. You need to use the DGS numbers. So that's gonna be a real hassle for some of us that know a film's number, but it's not the DGS number, it's the old film number because that just isn't gonna work anymore. So I just wanted to bring that up. So. I hope that this has helped you not be afraid to go into the card catalog. And if you get a chance and you come to the library in Salt Lake, this is what it'll look like when you get there. It's really been made over. So questions. And you can come off chat and I will turn off the recording.